Welcome to Advent. So we're just waiting for Christmas, so I have a little Christmas story. Three sons left their home and went out on their own, and they prospered. Getting together for Christmas, they discussed the gifts that they were able to give their elderly mother that year. The first son said, I built a big house for our mother. The second one said, I sent her a Mercedes Benz. The third smiled and said, I got you both beat. You remember how mom enjoyed reading the Bible? And you know she can't see very well. So I sent her a remarkable parrot that recites the entire Bible. It took the church 12 years to teach this parrot. He's one of a kind. Mom just has to name a chapter and a verse, and the parrot will recite it. Well, soon thereafter, Mom sent out letters of thanks. Dear Milton, she wrote to one son, the house you built is too large. I live only in one room, but I still have to keep the house clean. Dear Gerald, I'm too old to travel. I stay at home most of the time, and so I rarely use the Mercedes. Dearest Donald, you have the good sense to know what your mother likes. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> so today is the first Sunday of Advent and the first Sunday of the new liturgical calendar. So Happy New Year. Last Sunday on Christ the King Sunday, I explained that we would be beginning a whole new liturgical season, liturgical year. We're beginning year C. And as I told you last Sunday, we'll be hearing a lot from the Gospel of Luke. Advent is the first season of the Christian calendar, among others. There's Pentecost, Easter, the long green season. It consists of the four weeks that precede Christmas. And it is a season of waiting and anticipation. But the season of Advent is not simply just about waiting for the celebration of Christmas. It is not about counting the days until we can sing Silent Night or light the Christ candle. And it's not just about coloring the church purple in anticipation of turning to white in a few weeks. Traditionally, during Advent, we look at the themes of hope, peace, joy, and love, each on their respective Sundays. Today, we will focus on hope. And we also hear a lot of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah, like we heard from Jeremiah, which were fulfilled with the first coming of Christ and the birth of that baby in Bethlehem. However, there is yet another theme of Advent, which we often explore, particularly on the first Sunday of Advent, and that is the theme of Christ's second coming. You may wonder why do we talk about Christ's second coming as part of this Advent celebration? But we're, be, you know, we're still in Advent. We're waiting for him to come again, even though he came the first time. What does that have to do with preparing for Christmas? Well, it's important to understand first the meaning of the word Advent, which comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming towards or simply coming. When we speak of the Advent season, we're speaking of the season of coming. And what is coming? Well, certainly Christmas. But more than that, we know that Christ is coming again to finally bring his kingdom and fulfill. Remember, the here, but not yet. As children, our only understanding of Advent probably had to do with the little Advent calendars. I don't know if you guys remember those or if you have children, you have them, where you open a window each day. And as a child, I remember every morning I would get to open another little window and wait with anticipation until I got to open the presents under the tree on the 25th on the la after the last window. Advent is an opportunity for us to boldly proclaim the message of hope. In our gospel this morning, Jesus says there will be signs. And since the first coming of Jesus... There have been no shortage of people who are watching the signs, always willing to predict the end of the world. Jesus says if we look, we'll see the signs everywhere, in the sun, the moon, the stars, in the distress among the earth nations, and in the roaring of the sea and its waves. We can see them today in the pictures of refugees, in natural disasters, and in the world's violence. These signs are everywhere. And they are too easily and quickly misunderstood and misused. 
There will be signs or words of hope and reassurance. But far too often they're heard, they are heard as warnings and threats. The signs are often used to predict a future of impending doom. They become indicators that the world will end and you better shape up or God is going to get you. Our misunderstanding of the signs pushes us further into darkness and deeper into our fears. Our misuse of the signs blinds us to the coming of the Son of Man with power and great glory. There will be signs are not Jesus' words of warnings and threats. And Jesus does not ask us to predict the future. He never says these are the signs that the end of the world is here. Instead, he says that when we see these signs, we are to stand up, raise our heads, and know that help is on his way. Our redemption, our healing, our Savior has drawn near. Beloved of God, if your skies are cloudy and gray, Christ will come again. Does your load seem too heavy to bear? Christ will come again. Are you grieving? Christ will come again. Are you sick? Christ will come again. Evil in the world getting you down? Christ will come again. When it seems like darkness and death are winning, when it seems like the forces of evil are too strong, when the clouds are covering the sky, look to the east. Look for the Savior who is coming again. The season of Advent reminds us that we live between the two Advents, like I said, the first one where he already came, and the second when he's coming again. We are called to be realistic about the status of the world in which we live in, while at the same time we're also asked to have great hope in the future, for God's promises are forever. As I was preparing the sermon for this week, I was intrigued by Eugene Patterson's translation of the gospel lesson that I read to you this morning, and it comes from the message, which is something you can read. It's not a Bible that we use in, in church, but if you're ever confused about lessons or the words, he breaks it down to simple language, like this morning. He says, I invite you to hear these words. It will seem like all hell has broken loose, sun, moon, stars, earth, sea in an uproar, and everyone all over the world in a panic. The wind has been knocked out of them by the threat of doom. The powers that be are quaking. And then, then they'll see the Son of Man welcomed in grand style, a glorious welcome. When all this starts to happen, up on your feet. Stand tall with your heads high. Help is on the way. He told them a story. Look at the fig tree, any tree for that matter. When the leaves begin to show, one look tells you that summer is right around the corner. The same here. When you see these things happen, you know God's kingdom is about here. Don't brush this off. I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for this one too. These things will happen. Sky and earth will wear out, but my words won't wear out. But be on guard. Don't let the sharp edges of your expectation get dulled by parties and drinking and shopping. Otherwise, that day is going to take you by complete surprise. Spring on you suddenly like a trap, for it is going to come to everyone everywhere at once. So whatever you do, don't go to sleep at the switch. Pray constantly that you will have the strength and wits to make it through everything that's coming and end up on your feet before the Son of Man. Jesus is speaking of the very real sense that it will get worse before it gets better, or as the saying goes, it's always darkest before the dawn. Jesus indicates that it will seem as though evil is winning, that hell has been unleashed, and all the powers of evil have been released upon the world. But remember this, when it does get darkest, when the powers of evil seem to be winning, and it seems like there's no hope, that is when you should stand tall. Instead of hanging your head in shame and despair, that is when you should look up. Lift up your heads. The King of glory is coming. For when all hell is breaking loose, that is when your redemption is near. Or as Eugene Patterson says this morning, help is on the way. 
Jesus' parable of the fig tree teaches us how to read the signs. The Advent signs are as ordinary and common as a tree sprouting leaves. We see the leaves and we know something's happening. The summer is on its way. It's a new season with new life, new growth, new fruit. That is the promise and the good news of the Advent sign. Yes, the Advent seasons of our lives can be long, difficult, and painful. But we never face those seasons without the signs of hope and reassurance. Signs that point to the one who is coming again. The season of Advent has so much to teach us about having hope. Take Mary, the mother of Jesus, for an example. We don't talk much about her at times, but Mary has much to teach us about real faith and real hope. When we see her beautifully portrayed in Christmas pageants and Christmas cards and nativity scenes, she looks so serene and lovely. And the whole matter appears too simple and too easy. But think, think realistically for a moment. Consider realistically what Mary went through. It must have been incredibly difficult. The whisperings behind her back, the pointing of fingers at her, the false accusation, the raised eyebrows, the gossip, and the criticism that this teenage girl who is unwed is pregnant. The family pressures, the cruel laughter. Not to mention the long, hard journey that was mandated at a time when an expectant mother shouldn't have had to travel anywhere except to the nearest hospital. Then add on top of that the birth in a stable, no doctor, no midwife, no medicine, no anesthetic. Nothing but faith and hope in God. Mary was just a teenage girl from a poor family who lived in an obscure village in a tiny nation which is under the subjection of the Roman Empire who they despised. Then one day out of the blue, an angel came to her with a message from the Lord. It says, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be the Messiah, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. And I'll be honest, would you have believed that? The remarkable thing is that Mary did. That's real faith, and that's real hope. Here in Mary, we see a powerful portrait of Christian hope, painted with three bold strokes. The first one is that Mary was a person of great hope because she heard God's voice, and she responded. Mary was a person of great hope because she heard God's voice and obeyed his will. And finally, Mary was a person of great hope because she trusted God's power. She took it one step at a time, one day at a time, and trusted God for her future. The kind of hope that Mary had is the kind of hope that we all need. A Christian hope that enables us to hear God's voice, to obey God's will, and to trust in God's power. That's how it will be with God's world. Just when it seems that all hope is lost, and goodness and mercy shall never win, Jesus is always there to help, deciding for the hungry and the meek of the earth. And he sends us to be also that hope for these people. So, beloved of God, be alert, be ready. Wait with dogged expectation. Face honestly your despair. Light the candle in the darkness. Ache for the light. Persistent hope, even when it seems it's impossible. Stand up, raise your heads, for your redemption is drawing near. Help is on his way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I am your humble servant. I come before you today in need of hope. There are times when I feel helpless. There are times when I feel weak. I pray for hope. I need hope for a better future. I need hope for for a better life. I need hope for love and kindness. Some say that the sky is at its darkest just before the light. I need your light. Lord, in every way, I pray to be filled with your light. Help me to walk in your light and live my life in faith and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.